So to follow, I have uh, Dr. Patel, who's an alum of uh, Methodist uh, training currently in New Jersey, and he will continue with occlusive disease of the visceral up. Good morning. So we're going to talk about open and endovascular management of visceral occlusive disease. Uh, so a brief outline, we're going to discuss the etiology, the indications for treatment. We'll discuss endovascular options, uh, techniques, results, and then also talk about open revascularization methods, especially for chronic mesenteric ischemia and also for acute mesenteric ischemia. Small topic on median arcuate ligament syndrome, which ties into this as a factor for mesenteric ischemia. And then we'll discuss the comparative data between open and endo. So these are the main causes for arterial ischemia. I think the main thing that most people will see is atherosclerosis, dissection, and embolic disease. Uh, and the one thing that I'll note is with dissection, as CAT scanning and imaging is getting better, we're seeing a lot more dissection, and there's always a debate on what's the best way to manage it. Uh, so chronic mesenteric ischemia, it's rare, but atherosclerotic stenosis in visceral vessels is not. So 6 to 10 percent of autopsy specimens show that there is 50 percent or greater stenosis of at least one of the three main visceral trunks, and 27 percent of patients undergoing an angiogram for PVD are found to have asympt asymptomatic stenosis. Uh, most commonly, the atherosclerotic stenosis is at the origin of the artery, and there's spillover into the aorta, and quite often there's multiple vessels that are involved. So indications for treatment, I think any patient with symptoms for chronic mesenteric ischemia should have revascularization. Uh, most commonly, they'll describe postprandial pain and weight loss. And again, the goal of the procedure is to reduce pain, prevent in you know, in, in fraction of the bowel, and then to also regain weight and also improve nutrition. Uh, generally, no role for prophylactic revascularization. Quite often, you will get a phone call uh, from the consultants based on the CAT scan saying, hey, there is heavy plaque or stenosis or even occlusion of uh, the visceral arteries, and they want you to do something about it. Whether the patient's morbidly obese, eating pancakes in front of you, probably want to leave them alone. Uh, again, there's no role for TPN or conservative management. And then the unsettled issues are what's the best way to manage it? If you're going to treat, how many vessels do you treat? Do you treat both? Do you treat one? Endo or open? Uh, so the first POBA of the SMA was reported in 1980, and then primary stenting with balloon expandable bare metal stent. It's precise and allows superior radial force to use a balloon expandable stent. Uh, and I guess now the debate is balloon expandable versus covered. We'll discuss some of the data behind those options. And then a couple ways to access it is you can do a percutaneous anti-grade approach. If you're in the abdomen for a acute case, you can go in and do a retrograde approach to stent the SMA. Uh, so this is a, a trial out of Mayo, which essentially just shows that as endovascular therapies are becoming more prevalent, open surgery is obviously declining. I think everyone's realized that. Uh, so the technique when you're doing an endovascular approach is aortogram. You want to do an AP and lateral view to really identify the origin of the artery. Uh, selectively catheterize the vessel. Uh, how you're going to access it really depends on what you're treating. Uh, I think that the general teaching is if you're going to do a celiac, the femoral artery is a good access and the SMA because that downward pitch, uh, the brachial is a good approach. Uh, the one thing that I'll talk about with the celiac is that always look at the CAT scan. Uh, not all celiac arteries come out, you know, in an AP direction. A lot of times they'll angle up or angle down. And depending on which way that celiac is going, you can save a lot of time on the procedure by looking at the CAT scan and sometimes considering doing a brachial access if the, if the celiac has a strong downward pitch because uh, sometimes that bend is harder to get into. Um, so put a six French guide cath in and a sheath. You use a 0.14 wire. You pre-dilate with a small balloon, repeat the angiogram, and then put your balloon expandable stent in. Usually a six to seven millimeter stent will suffice with about two millimeters hanging out into the aorta. Completion angiogram, the technical endpoints are less than 10 to 30 percent residual stenosis, and you should have less than 10 percent when you do a pullback pressure on it. Uh, this is a really, is my, your, oh, that picture is much better than mine. Uh, so this just essentially shows the celiac artery with a high takeoff kind of going up. So obviously a, depending on the angle, if it's downward, you want to come from the arm. If it's got a upward bend, the groin is going to be a little bit easier for you to work through. Uh, so for endovascular disease, if you have a short segment stenosis, it's probably favorable for an endovascular approach. Minimal to moderate calcification. I think nowadays as we're getting better with endovascular techniques, I think the amount of calcium and plaque is kind of a little bit of a gray area. And I think most people would at least try endo first. Uh, and if they have some difficulties getting their wire across or crossing lesion, uh, 
then you might move to an open option afterwards. Uh, so I, I don't know if calcium necessarily is a, a factor on you not doing the intervention. Uh, again, unfavorable, severe calcification, occlusion, a long lesion, the vessel is small, and then there's a higher rate of distal embolization and restenosis and also need for re-intervention. Uh, so this is essentially data on balloon, or sorry, bare metal stenting with a balloon expandable stent. Uh, and the main highlight is that if you look at the mortality, it's very low, which is nice. Uh, patency, if you look at the years, it's all short-term patency at one year or less. And at one year, the patency is pretty decent. Uh, so the outcomes, this is a study done which shows that 87 vessels and 65 patients, uh, 22 patients had both vessels treated. I generally go for one. Uh, it's just the way I've done it is usually you're trying to resolve their symptoms and if you can open up the SMA, that's usually sufficient for most patients. Uh, and again, duration at one, three, and six months, what they found is that their primary patency is pretty high at 65%, but these are all short-term data. Uh, so there's no difference in patency between occluded and stenotic vessels, no impact on the vessel that's treated, the number of vessels that are treated, uh, the stent type, stent length, or the number of stents that are used. Femoral access is associated with reduced patency. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, and there's no impact of procedural factors on survival. And in their particular study, no patient that underwent a bowel resection survived. Uh, that is... So instant restenosis is one of the things that you're going to deal with. If you put stents in, you've got to do surveillance. You've got to follow these stents because you will develop restenosis, and it's not uncommon for you to need to re-intervene either with the follow-up balloon angioplasty or even relining the stent. Uh, if you do need to re-intervene, outcomes are pretty good on maintaining that stent as long as you're following it. Uh, so I guess the discussion is whether or not to use a covered stent or a bare stent. Uh, this is one study. It's a retrospective study, which clearly shows in their case that primary patency at 18 months was significantly better for a covered stent. So this just shows a long lesion, and there's a flush occlusion of the celiac and SMA. And what's the best way to treat this? Uh, I think, again, most of us, if you can find a nub and you can access that SMA, you'd probably try to canalize it and put a stent in if you can. Uh, like with all things, you don't want to burn your bridges for the bypass uh, by being overly aggressive with an endovascular technique. Uh, so if you have a patient with chronic mesenteric ischemia, now they've got an acute occlusion. Uh, usually when you open the abdomen, you can do an embolectomy, clean out the th clot, or you can do a bypass. Uh, the thing we'll talk about the bypass is there's always discussion on what's the best approach, anagrade versus retrograde. You can do a trans aortic splanchnic and endarterectomy. And then obviously there's the treatment for median arcuate ligament syndrome, which is usually done uh, through an open procedure or a laparoscopic procedure. Uh, so for a aortoceliac or an anagrade bypass, you can do a midline or transverse abdominal incision. Uh, the supraceliac artery, it's usually not disease and healthy. Uh, it's exposed to the hiatus through the gastroepatic ligament and then dividing the cruse. And then you want to do a retropancreatic tunnel to the proximal or mid-SFA. And the conduit usually uses a bifurcated graph, a 12 by 7 or a 12 by 6. Uh, this just shows the anatomy. It's the supraceliac, supraceliac aorta and then kind of get into the SMA at the root of the mesentery. So for a retrograde bypass, the inflow is the distal aorta or the iliacs. The SMA is exposed by taking down the ligament of the trites at the fourth portion of the duodenum. You can do an end to side or, a, an, or an end to end. Uh, usually it's appropriate when a anagrade bypass is prohibitive. Uh, it's definitely faster. The exposure is usually a lot easier to dissect out the iliac than it is a supraceliac aorta. Uh, and again, you allow, by doing this, you can avoid cross clamping the aorta and poor surgical candidates. Uh, one of the things that you want to worry about when you do this is the length of your bypass graft and avoiding kinks, which is usually most common. So you definitely want to check on your bypass graft once you've completed it to make sure when the bowel is replaced that you don't lose your Doppler signal and there's a good pulse in the graft. Uh, for your conduit, you can use either saphenous vein. Usually if you have an infected abdomen, gross contamination, your conduit is probably going to be the saphenous vein. Uh, in a chronic case, you can usually use the bi with a prosthetic graft and you'll do just fine. Uh, I'm going to skip through this. Uh, so a trans aortic endorectomy is another option. If you have uh, an acute ischemic case, on top of that, you've got a contaminated abdomen. You know there's just origin of the SMA and celiac are both involved. You can do a trans aortic endorectomy and take it down to the level of the renals, clean it out. Usually the aorta is big enough that you don't need to patch it. 
oh, my pictures are really bad. Yeah, this is just a schematic of, of what you can do. You take it off, clear out the plaque, and then sew it back together. Uh, so for chronic disease, the results of open surgery. So most people, I think, would argue that if you're especially doing an aortoiliac or supraciliac super aortic bypass, that at that point you're already there. Doing two vessels is probably reasonable. Uh, so I, there's really not a lot of difference in patency, but I think if you're going to be in the abdomen, most people would probably just do both. Uh, no difference in graft patency also between prosthetic and vein. And for most people, there's excellent relief of pain, and they generally do tend to regain weight after the operation. Uh, so the highlight here is that unlike the endovascular options, the long-term success is really good, but the mortality rates are also significantly higher and also a much higher morbidity associated with open surgery. Uh, so again, some of the complications of open surgery, bleeding, MI, malnutrition, wound healing issues. So endo versus open, there is no level one data. The existing literature primarily is a series of open or endovascular therapy. And then there's obviously some selection bias based on the, ana the anatomic complexity of the lesions and also patient comorbidities. Obviously, if you have an old, frail lady, you might be a little bit more aggressive on an endo approach versus an open. Uh, so the surgical treatment of acute ischemia associated with high mortalities, 40 to 60%. Uh, open treatment is usually necessary because you want to be able to look at the bowel, resect any dead bowel. Uh, a lot of times if you're in there, you can evaluate them. Uh, you can do an embolectomy, uh, revascularize. If there is a lesion on the proximal SFA, a lot of times you can do a retrograde step by accessing the SMA. Uh, there's inside tooth thrombosis. You usually have to do a mesenteric bypass, either anagrade or retrograde stenting. And you want to avoid prosthesis when there is gross contamination. Uh, so this is just a picture of an embolectomy, root of the mesentery, transverse arteriotomy. Obviously, if there's heavy plaque in the artery and you're concerned, is sometimes rather than doing transverse arteriotomy, you might be doing longitudinal. That way you can allow it to endarterectomize the plaque and then patch it closed. Uh, so the treatment for median arch malignant syndrome, open or laparoscopic release, and the key is to a celiac ganglionectomy. So conclusions, aggressive interventional for CMI is ultimately fatal. Uh, supplement nutrition early in the preoperative period. And the open vascularizations are usually the most durable, but again, there is also higher morbidity and mortality. Uh, and endovascular treatment avoids the inherent risk of morbidity and mortality. And there are some significant benefits, but you're going to probably sacrifice on long-term patency. Uh, so the key is you want to tailor your therapy to the individual. The choice of the intervention is obviously specific to the patient and their needs. Uh, so there's really just not one option for every patient. And again, the main thing for all things is don't burn your bridges for open surgery. Thanks.